Uh, we are wrapping up our, serve, our, our series this weekend, uh, and the series we're doing called Jumpstart. And uh, we have a guest speaker who's come up to share with us. And so I'm going to go ahead and invite uh, Kyle Henderson to the stage. Put your hands together for Kyle. Uh, Kyle is a, a dear friend of mine. We have served in ministry many years. And if you've been here uh, a couple of years ago, I think about four years ago now, yeah. um, uh, Kyle was up here speaking again. Really, if there's ever a man bun on stage, he's the one who's bringing it. So uh, I'm really excited for the message that Kyle's going to share, and I, I really believe you're going to be blessed by it. Awesome. Thanks, dude. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have a question. My hope is that if someone doesn't have a pair, but maybe they have their old Pop Warner shoulder pads, they could just wear your Pop Warner shoulder pads here next Sunday. I think that is okay as well. Uh, Well, as Mike said, my name is Kyle, and uh, I actually get to serve as a campus pastor at a multi-site church in Salt Lake City, Utah. And so I am grateful to be here with Mike. I've known Mike for over 15 years now, and I I know that because it was right around this time, about 15 years ago, that Mike was interviewing me for a job at a church in Gilbert, Arizona. And I know that because in April, my wife and I are celebrating 15 years of marriage, and I knew Mike before my wife and I became husband and wife. And so um, I've been able to know Mike there. Uh, Mike also helped uh, hire me at a church in Huntington Beach, California. And so you might think to yourself uh, that over the course of 15 years, I have tons of stories and tons of life experience with Mike. Mike and I uh, have traveled to other countries together. Uh, our families have camped uh, together. We've uh, celebrated milestones like visiting each other uh, in the hospital when, uh, when we've had kids. Uh, we've laughed together. We've cried together. Uh, Mike and I have consoled each other when our Dodgers didn't make it all the way um, time and time again, Uh, and I received a phone call uh, with Mike crying and whining when his Rams lost the Super Bowl. Uh, I'm sure you guys did too. Uh, And uh, we've we've enjoyed our our company with each other. So when Mike says to me, Kyle, would you come up and would you share, uh, would you wrap up our series together? I said, absolutely. Uh, I was ready to hop on a plane. I threw all my San Francisco 49er gear that I own uh, into a bag, uh, and I've worn it all this entire trip uh, running and in downtown Seattle. And I will tell you, more people have said go Niners than I thought possible. So uh, you guys have been very gracious to me in my time up here. But four weeks ago, uh, we kicked off a brand new series called Jumpstart. And the idea behind this series was kind of prompted by asking a question of how many people uh, do New Year's resolutions. And uh, whether you name them or not, I believe that we, as people, like to go into the new year uh, striving to be better than the previous year. I don't think there's anyone here in this room who would say, I hope this next year is worse than my year I just had. We all want to be better, and so we set goals for ourselves. Even if we don't name them, even if we don't announce them to the world, We set goals for ourselves, goals about uh, having a a better mental health or better physical health or financial health or even relational health. And our hope was that in the course of this series, we can identify specific areas, uh, areas that we can grow in our lives for a better 2024. And so we started kind of laying the foundation of what it would look like to have a healthier, growing relationship with God, because I believe uh, as a pastor that that uh, can jumpstart every aspect and relationship of our lives. And then we talked about uh, kind of long-term parenting, how to have a, a productive kind of uh, goal-oriented kind of workplace uh, relationship and to build purposeful work. And then we kind of wrapped up last week talking about intentional community. And if this is your first time here, Just know that each of these kind of messages, even though they've had this overarching theme of jumpstart, um, have been kind of standalone. So this is your first time here. You're not like behind. You don't have to leave and and go watch everything right now before you hear this message. But I would encourage you to go back online and watch the previous four weeks. But today, I've been invited up to kind of wrap up our time together and talk about one key area, an area of growth in our lives uh, that I believe will help us into 2024. And that area is our marriages. Now, if you're sitting here and you are not married at all, uh, or you have been married, uh, or you might want to get married, or you may not know if you want to get married, I fully believe that this conversation uh, hits all of us. And so don't tune out. uh, Don't shut down. You don't have to be married to take something from our conversation today. But if we're going to talk about healthy marriages, I believe we have to jump right into the beginning of it all. And in Genesis Chapter 2, starting in verse 19, this is what 
is written. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. And in verse 24, this is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. So at the beginning of all creation, God has this onslaught creating every single thing, and he gets to the pinnacle of his creation, humankind, and the one thing that isn't good is man being alone. This is the culmination of what uh, we've talked about over this series, but also what I believe for humanity, that we were meant to be in community with others, and a part of that community relationship is marriage. And so in the beginning, God sees that it's not good for man to be alone. Man can't do what God designed man to do, which was kind of steward and cultivate the ground and take care of it. Uh, so God, God allows, God creates another being to come alongside man, not in front of man, not behind man, but next and side by side. And it's this marriage relationship that God designed, intended for humanity to then rule over and lord over the earth and care for the beasts and the birds and the fish and the ground. This is a part of that relationship. And so like I said, whether you're someone who is married or has been married or someone who might want to get married, I believe scripture is very clear as to the purpose, the meaning, the design behind marriage and a marriage relationship. And it starts right here. But at the beginning, it wasn't enough for man to be by himself. God needed man to have someone else with him to help take care of the earth. And if this union right here between man and woman, between husband and wife, if this is a part of that design, if this is a part of that creational aspect of the world, what happens when that relationship sours? Is it possible to make sure that relationship doesn't sour and actually stays healthy and growing? Now, full disclosure, I fully believe that the healthiest marriage relationship is a growing marriage that is gospel-centered. So that is the direction that I am choosing to come at this conversation with. Uh, Pastor Tim Keller, who passed away uh, about a year ago, uh, coming up here in a few months, he wrote this book called The Meaning of Marriage, uh, and he wrote this. In any relationship, there will be frightening spells in which your feelings of love dry up. And when that happens, you must remember that the essence of marriage is that it is a covenant, a commitment, a promise of future love. Now, whether you are someone who is in this room right now and you've chosen to follow Jesus and you're like, yeah, I want to have a gospel-centered marriage, what does that look like? Or you're like, I'm just investigating this Jesus thing. I believe that whatever camp you you sit in right now, looking at what Christians say, looking at the the relationship between uh, the gospel and what the gospel says is a helpful way for you to approach your marriage relationship. But Tim Keller was right that we're, there's going to come a time in your marriage relationship where you feel a little bit different than you used to. I think if we're honest with ourselves and you've been married for a year or uh, 25 years, you feel differently than you did the first time you met your spouse. And that's okay. The goal of marriage, the purpose of marriage, isn't to have this bliss-filled forever feeling. That's in fairy tales. That's in Disney movies. It's not this constant, ta- uh, uh, a constant state of bliss that exists. The meaning of marriage isn't that it's also, it's not that it's just another relationship. Marriage is different. It's special. It's elevated uh, up against all other uh, designs of relationship and community with people. Marriage is also not something that you should kind of enter into lightly or, or not actually put a lot of effort into. In fact, the reality is that when we lose the meaning, we just begin to go through the motions. And this is true of anything, right? Uh, I love running. Uh, Mike and I actually ran our first uh, marathon together uh, years and years ago. Uh, And I love running. And I've done a handful of marathons. And there was one specific marathon that I was getting ready to run. 
And uh, there's a, a girl that we both know, a woman that we both know, who is, uh, uh, she qualified for Boston. Uh, she ultra marathons and runs crazy distances. Uh, and leading up to this marathon, she committed to me to be a pacer for me. I had a, a dream of, of PRing and having a great race. And so she said, Kyle, I'll, I'll pace with you. I'll pace you and I'll help push you. And so I did my training, my 12 to 16 weeks of training. I got all the mileage in that I needed to get in thinking that this was going to be the race that I would PR. This would be the race that I would just absolutely destroy my previous time. Spoiler alert, I did not. I got worse than my best time, even with having a pacer, even with all the training that I did. And in looking back and in races that I've run since then, I can pinpoint exactly what happened. You see, that first race that I did was fun. It was exciting. It was exhilarating. It was something new for me. And then each subsequent race became just running. I was literally going through the motions. I got my mileage in, and if you're someone who likes to run or or ride bikes or do any kind of swimming activities, uh, getting the mileage in, getting the distance in is is part of uh, the importance of being successful. But there's so many other elements. There's so many different types of cross-training. And I remember looking back and thinking to myself, I was a complete and utter failure primarily because I was just going through the motions of this running. And so I believe that we lose the meaning when you're just going through the motions. This is true with many important relationships in our lives, including our marriage relationships. So if we have to remember the meaning behind it, where do we go? Where do we turn to? And I believe we can turn to Scripture. Uh, The Apostle Paul wrote uh, this letter to the church in Ephesus uh, 2,000 years ago. And he penned these words that were absolutely just drastically different than the male-dominated society would have understood marriage to be. And this is what the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5, starting in verse 21. He says this, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing of, of, with water through the word. And to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother to be united to his wife. Paul's going back to this Genesis account here. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and his wife must respect her husband. There is a lot to unpack here in what Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus at the last part of his letter, but I want to begin with this. You can't understand gospel-centered marriage if you don't understand Christ and the church. Now, you could be in this room today and you consider yourself a follower of Jesus and you're thinking, this, this is perfect. Tell me what gospel-centered marriage is. You also might be visiting for the first time, maybe for the first time in a long time, stepping foot back in a church and you're thinking, okay, yeah, but I don't believe in the gospel, so how can I have a healthy or happy or growing marriage? Like I said previously, I believe whatever you believe about Jesus If you understand what Christians believe about Jesus, his his purpose on this earth, and what he did in relation to the church, I think that a gospel-centered marriage is still something that you uh, can attune to, something that you can still look towards as you begin to develop a healthy marriage relationship. Because for all of humanity, marriage has been this uh, connectedness between two very different people into one. But when it's the gospel, when it's a gospel marriage, it's a little bit different. Yes, it is your love story with your spouse, and it's something else. Yes, if you are a Jesus follower, it is uh, two becoming one, combining families, uh, raising a family potentially, going on all these adventures, 
and it's something else. Your marriage is the story of two people coming together, plus it's more. See, in the gospel, your marriage is a living metaphor of what Jesus did for the church. See, people are watching. And these people that are watching, maybe for the first time, are seeing the gospel in action. Your marriage is a sermon to your family members and to your friends at the relationship between Jesus and the church, you and your spouse. It's the gospel. It's the story of Jesus' sacrifice for his bride, for the world. It's the good news. And more than that, it's God's attempt to give you an opportunity to experience joy and community with someone else. It's one way that God takes happiness and holiness and blends and weaves it together like this beautiful tapestry. And when one person in a marriage lays down their life for the other, when they put aside their desires, their wants, their ego, it is an in-living color image of Jesus' sacrifice for humanity. The reality is, sometimes it doesn't feel that way, does it? When you have careers that take a lot out of you, when you have household chores and bills and kids' activities, sometimes the marriage relationship takes a back seat. I'll never forget uh, when we went from a family of three to four. Uh, my daughter Adeline is 12 and my son Clayton is nine. And so she was almost three years old when, when her brother was born. Uh, my wife worked full-time. I worked full-time. I was going back to school uh, to get my master's. Uh, and now we brought another little child into the mix. It completely wrecked everything, this beautiful balance that we had created. Um, I don't mean my son wrecked it. I'm just saying the addition of another child uh, uh, alongside a toddler, alongside two full-time working parents uh, who were also trying to figure out how to be husband and wife together. And so we made a decision. We are firm believers that if you have something that is wrong with you physically, you go see a doctor. Maybe you go see a physical therapist. And so for us, we decided to do something about it. We decided to go to counseling. We thought to ourselves, this relationship was so important that the way we interacted with each other was so important, not just for ourselves, but also for our kids, that we needed to do something about it. We needed to go get help. Our goal was to be a married couple long after our kids left our home. And so understanding that a gospel-centered marriage has to do with understanding Jesus and what he did for the church was central. And so the question is, what does scripture say that Jesus did for the church? Jesus loved the church and he laid down his life for her. You want to know how to have a healthy and growing marriage relationship with your spouse or your future spouse? Understand first what Jesus did for the church. If you start there, I can promise you your relationship won't be perfect. I can promise you that you won't immediately stop fighting. I can promise you that your spouse will still seem annoying to you at times, or you'll want to have a guy's night or a gal's night, uh, because that's just how we are wired as human beings. I think those are healthy aspects of being a human being. But I can tell you, you'll begin to see something different in your spouse. Tim Keller talks a lot about the marriage relationship, and, and he mentions something uh, in one of his messages and in the meeting of marriage about uh, how your spouse is imperfect, but you have a front row seat to watching them become and helping them become the person that God designed them to be. Because if you understand what Jesus did for the church and then you view your spouse in the same way, then you will begin to understand just a little bit more about what sacrificial love is. Now, as we continue to talk through this, uh, there's probably questions that are coming up. And so I want to kind of walk through some of those questions with us this morning. The first question is, you might have is, so who's really watching my marriage? I, I heard you say something about someone watching my marriage. Who's actually uh, watching my marriage? And, and the, the honest answer is everybody. Everybody is watching how you interact in a marriage relationship. But your kids definitely are watching your marriage. And if you're fortunate enough right now to not have kids yet uh, or to uh, not be married, um, let me tell you, your kids will watch how you interact as a husband 
or a wife. They'll watch how you treat your spouse, how you talk to your spouse. They'll be paying attention. Uh, I have made a concerted effort over the span uh, of the past five, ten years of my marriage relationship to get better at apologizing to my wife in front of my kids, apologizing to my kids uh, when I do something wrong to them. In fact, just the other day, it was like a month ago, uh, I apologized to my daughter, Adeline, uh, for kind of overreacting at something, and she was like shocked that I said, I'm sorry. Uh, that was kind of a gut punch. She's almost 12, she's 12 years old, and that was like the first time that she really identified the fact that I was willing to say, I'm sorry. But I'll, I'll tell you this, your kids and those around you your marriage relationship, how you treat your spouse, might be the first uh, glimpse of what the gospel is for them. So there should be an added weight to that. Here's another question that you might be asking. Uh, what if I'm divorced or what if I'm single? I would argue that you're probably in a better spot than most uh, people who are married because now you have an opportunity to take this idea, this gospel-centered marriage, how to view your spouse, understanding what Jesus did for the church, and you can begin to prepare yourself for that person should you choose to want to marry. That you have a chance right now uh, to kind of uh, take this, to live in it for a while, and then in the dating scene, begin to piece together the kind of spouse that you want to be and the kind of spouse that you want to be with. I think uh, oftentimes the church today, uh, we kind of intentionally or unintentionally make those who are divorced or those who are still single, single like second-class citizens. The reality is that is not true. In fact, uh, the Christian worldview is one of the first worldviews that elevated those who were not in marriage relationships. I want to get back to that. I want to elevate the person who maybe doesn't know yet or, or kind of wants to but hasn't found the right person and help them enter into a gospel-centered marriage. Here's a, another question that you might be thinking, well, I'm in a marriage relationship. What if I haven't been doing it this way? Uh, there's a, an old adage, an old question that gets asked a lot. Uh, when is the best time to plant a tree? And the answer is 20 years ago. The question goes on, when is the second best time? The answer is today. No matter what type of marriage relationship you've had, uh, no matter how you have operated in a marriage relationship with your spouse or your soon-to-be uh, spouse, um, it's never too late to adjust, to prepare, to begin to understand how Jesus uh, sacrificed himself for the church and then to live that way for your spouse. The only way that we can engage marriage in this way is when we understand what happens before that long passage of verses 21 on uh, in Ephesians chapter 5. And let's read Ephesians chapter 5, starting at verse 1. This is how we understand how to live this way. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. You see, following Jesus' example requires a deep, fundamental, pervasive commitment to relinquish personal agendas. Human beings have this innate desire uh, to be selfish, to want to put our agenda, our ego, in front of other people. Jesus is the perfect example of giving up what was owed to him, of setting aside what was owed to him, his power, his authority, and instead giving it up for others. Jesus gave up what he had every right to hold on to, to give us what we need, and that came at a great cost to himself. If you are a follower of Jesus, your marriage my marriage should make it easier for other people to see the gospel and how we interact with each other. These two verses that we just read, I would sum up kind of what the verses are saying in, in one word, and that word is humility. And here's what I believe. Humility believes the best before it assumes the worst. If you want a marriage that is healthy, that is happy, that is growing, then set aside the me in favor of the we. Focus on the other. 
sharing in a marriage relationship with humility is a huge, huge next step to experiencing a growing, healthy, happy relationship. And then that relationship gets to be an example of what the gospel is to those around you. So how can two people come together and find fulfillment and joy in this marriage relationship? Ephesians 5.21 says this, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Submission isn't about deserving. It's about revering. See, that word submit is something that kind of causes angst in our culture today. Even in a place like this, it might cause a little bit of worry. Like, what is, what is this guy telling me to do? In a gospel-centered marriage, wives don't respect their husbands because they deserve it. It would be great if that were true, but that's just not the case. In a gospel-centered marriage, husbands don't love their wives because they deserve it. It would be great and perfect if that were true, but that's not what a gospel-centered marriage is. Is. There are so many scriptures uh, talking about relationships between parents and kids, talking about relationships between uh, people and other people. And the biggest thing that you can get out of all of those, the biggest truth you can get out of all those relationships is that you can do only what you can control. And so husbands, love your wives. Wives, respect your husbands. Sometimes it, they don't deserve it. I know I don't deserve it. But this is what we're talking about when we talk about a gospel-centered marriage. The motivating factor deep down is respect and love for what Christ did for the church. That's how we get to a marriage that is healthy, growing, as if it's gospel-centered. So what does this mean for us? The The first thing I think it means is husbands... We need to submit to her need. It's very easy right now if you're a lady in the room and today or a week from now, your husband uh, asked you uh, what, what he can do to serve you. You might have two responses. The first response might be a response that I would personally have. And it would be like, oh, you're just doing that because the pastor said to do that. Uh, and so I don't know. Yes, that might be the case. But the second response that I would encourage you to say to yourself is, he loves me, and so he wants to serve me. And then to share and to communicate in what that looks like for you. Wives, here's your part. Submit to his lead. Now, I am smart enough to know that this word submit is a very angsty word, especially in this line right here. Let me tell you what this word does not mean. It doesn't mean that your husband gets to control you. That's not what it means at all, ladies. And guys, that's not what it means at all. We tend to get a little angsty. It doesn't matter what gender you are, this idea of submit. We don't want to submit. I'm my own person. This is very much a a Western society thing. Like I'm my own individual person. I get to do and say what I want to do. The same is true in a marriage relationship. This term submission, hearing it, is kind of like running sandpaper on a sunburn. It's uncomfortable, and it hurts, and you want it to stop. But submission isn't about giving up who you are and letting your husband make all the decisions. Submission isn't, husbands, about making your wife come to you to ask permission to do certain things in and out of the household. Submission is a connection to Jesus, to Christ, and the church, and what he did for the church. Remember, Husbands, love and lay down your life in the same way that Christ loved and laid down his life for the church. Wives, submit to your husbands in the same way that we, as the church, submit to Jesus. I would imagine there isn't a person in this room, married or not, who wouldn't want a marriage relationship that is loving and full of mutual submission. Unfortunately, for a lot of us, Marriages are like soda. They get flat over time. But God designed marriages to be like wine, where they get better with time. And it takes work. It does take work. If you want to understand how to have a healthy and growing marriage relationship, one that is gospel-centered, then I would, I would encourage you to do 
for your spouse what Jesus did for you. Do for your spouse what Jesus has done for you. If you walk away today believing that your marriage relationship can be perfect because of this concept right here, then I've led you astray. It does take work. It takes opportunity. It takes uh, date nights and communication. And maybe it takes a counseling appointment or two so you guys can work on communication together. The Disney fairy tale effect, though, says that your marriage can and should be perfect with no issues and butterflies and sunny all the time. I do believe that you can begin to change your mindset and how you, how you relate to your spouse, how you love and care for your spouse, if you understand and, and grab onto what Jesus did for you. And then you, in turn, do that for your spouse or your future spouse. Because real life is better. The messiness of marriage relationships is so much better. When you, know, when you know that this person that you are walking alongside with would lay down her life for you, or when you know this person that you get to spend your life with will lay down his life for you, will put away all of his personal agendas, all of his goals, and place you first in his life. The reality is, for as much intentionality as it takes, the only way to fully grasp a gospel-centered relationship is understanding what Jesus has done for the church, understanding what Jesus has done for you, and then take that and do that for your spouse. As we move into this second month of 2024, my hope is that you can jumpstart these relationships that are pivotal, that are central, knowing that it's not just you two potentially, it's also your children and children watching you, knowing that if you can if you can interact with your spouse in the way that Jesus interacted with the church, that would be the greatest possible gospel message that any person up here could ever share or speak or teach to you. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you. First and foremost, for who you've been, who you are, who you always will be. God, we thank you for helping us begin to understand what it means to be in a communal relationship with someone else. And that, God, this marriage relationship should be something that, that points to the gospel. God, I pray that today we can begin to understand how to have a gospel view of our marriage so that we love our spouse in the way that you love the church, that we would, that we would give up our lives for our spouse in the way that you give up your life for the church. And God, may that be the greatest message of the gospel that anyone around us has seen. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.